Thanks so much. It's such a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak here today. So I'm a professor of statistics at University of Washington. And what I want to tell you about today is how even though we now live in an, area of, in an era excuse me, of big data, big science, team science, we need statisticians and classical statistical training more than ever. And so we've heard a lot how there's a Twitter hashtag that we're all supposed to be using today. So I thought that to keep with that spirit, I would motivate my talk by um, a Twitter post from a few weeks ago. So I asked, within the context of interdisciplinary data science, what is the number one thing that rigorous statistical training brings to the table? And I got a lot of really interesting answers, which basically organized along three themes. So the first theme was that the reason that we need statistics within the context of big data science is because statistics allows us to evaluate whether the data that was collected is sufficient to answer the question that was asked. And a lot of people gave different variants of this answer. So I thought this was a really interesting answer. Um, and the fact that it came up so many times maybe merits a little bit of discussion. So really, the idea here is that one of the key concepts behind all of statistics is the notion of experimental design. If you have a question that you want answered, you don't just start uh, rooting around in the dark trying to answer it using data. Instead, you should sit down and thoughtfully design an experiment that will allow you to answer that question. So if we could, we'd carefully design all of our experiments. But of course, we live in the real world. And often, this is impossible for a number of reasons. And one reason that it's not possible is because it might be unethical. So a lot of my research, as you'll hear, has to do with applications to biomedical research. So for example, we can't randomize medical treatments to people. It would be really great if we could get clear-cut answers about the effect of a medical treatment by assigning half of people to treatment and half of people to control. But of course, we can't do that for pretty obvious reasons. Um, another reason that we often can't design experiments the way that we would want to from a statistical perspective is because it might just be impossible. So if we want to know the role of genetic makeup on some disease or on smoking risk or on whatever it is, if we could, we would uh, randomize people to genetic makeup, but of course we can't. We also can't randomize half of the people in our study to have one socioeconomic status and half of the people to have another. So statistically, we know how to design experiments, but in the real world, we often can't. So within the context of the fact that the data that we get is typically not from a well-designed experiment, we need to be really careful. And one thing that we need to do is we need to be able to figure out which questions are actually answerable based on our data. And there can be a gap between the data that we have and the questions that we wish we could answer on our data. But understanding that gap and making sure that we only answer questions that we can answer is really critical to drawing valid conclusions from our data. And another thing that we can try to do is to carefully expand the set of questions that we can answer using the data that we have, using ideas from causal inference and related fields. But these are things that need to be done with care, and they all require a deep understanding of statistics. So the next theme um, in the answers that I received is that statistics and a deep understanding of statistics gives us a rigorous framework for quantifying uncertainty. So of course, we all learned about things like p-values and confidence intervals in our basic statistics classes. So in a simple setting, we actually know how to quantify uncertainty, and this is part of our standard statistical toolkit. So we know that in theory, we should just get a data set and use our data to perform a single pre-specified analysis. And if we've done that, then we know exactly how to quantify uncertainty. We have things like p-values and confidence intervals. But once again, we live in the real world, and it's totally unrealistic that we're going to use a data set just to answer exactly one pre-specified question. In practice, our data are expensive, our data are limited, and we're going to try to get as much as we can out of our data. But to make matters even worse from a statistical perspective, not only do we perform a lot of analyses on our data, but we use the results of one analysis to determine what questions we want to ask next. And so we actually proceed in this iterative way where we don't know in advance all the questions we're going to ask, and we actually determine what question we want to ask next based on the previous answer we got. And this becomes very quickly a very tricky statistical setting where it's actually very hard to quantify the uncertainty associated with our analyses. It's hard to know how sure we can be of the results that we've gotten. And unfortunately, this can lead to really serious problems. Um, we can refer to this as double dipping. And when we fail to account for double dipping when drawing conclusions from our data, things can go really wrong. Um, it they can go spectacularly wrong in a lot of different areas. But one way that I see it a lot is within 
science. Um, in the last few years, people have been talking a lot about the idea that there's a reproducibility crisis in science, where uh, results that are published in a peer-reviewed article might turn out not to hold up to further scrutiny if someone else collects you know, a new data set to try to answer the same question. Um, so the, the chart here is from Nature, which is one of the premier scientific journals, and they surveyed 1,600 researchers on whether or not there's a reproducibility crisis in science. And 90% of the researchers said, yes, there is a reproducibility crisis. And a lot of this crisis really stems directly from the fact that, once again, we're not looking at a data set just one or two or three times to answer pre-specified questions. Instead, we're looking again and again and again, and we're using the answers to our previous questions to inform our future questions. And finally, the last answer that I, or the last set of answers that I got also had a common theme. And really, the, the answer that I found very interesting was that someone said, the reason that we have models is not to fit the data, but to sharpen the questions. So if we think about that for a second, the reason we need statistical modeling is not even to understand the data, but to better understand our questions. And I think anybody who's tried to fit a statistical model understands what this means. So to, for a concrete example, um, suppose that we're interested in a model for smoking and asthma. And I tell you, you know, go out there, collect some data, and try to come up with some model for the association between smoking and asthma. So OK, you might think about that. And you might come back to me and say you want to fit a logistic regression model. So this is a very standard model in statistics. Um, here, y can be an asthma diagnosis, and x is number of packs smoked per day. And so this model is saying that basically the probability that someone has an asthma diagnosis is just a function of the number of packs per day. And basically, if this coefficient beta is positive, then the more the person smokes, the higher the probability of an asthma diagnosis. And this seems like a pretty reasonable model at first glance. But sort of the more we think about it, the more we might begin to question whether this is the right model. So for example, this model only incorporates both asthma and number of packs smoked per day. Um, there might be a lot of other things that we think should be included in the model, like age, physical activity, and socioeconomic status, because we might, those, we might expect those also to be associated with smoking and asthma, and that seems like something we should probably incorporate in the model. Or maybe we want a different model entirely that says that there's some underlying factor which maybe we don't have access to, like genetic makeup, that causes both smoking risk and asthma risk. Um, so when we start trying to write out in mathematical or statistical, statistical terms the model that we're interested, we quickly realize that our initial question was too vague. And really, the experience of statistical modeling causes us to refine these questions in a way that we wouldn't otherwise be doing. So now I just want to move on from this to just say a, a few words about my work, um, which involves statistical learning with applications to biomedical research. And so this is a really fun area to be involved in because the field of biology has just been transformed in the last 20 years with new technologies that make it possible to measure things that we previously thought were completely unmeasurable. So one example of this has to do with, with sequencing the human genome. So of course the human genome was sequenced almost 20 years ago now. And in the last 20 years, the technology has just been completely transformed so that now it's actually pretty inexpensive to get a genome sequenced. So people have hoped for the last 20 years that when it came to pass that human genome sequence would eventually become this cheap, that we would be able to use your individual DNA sequence in order to inform our predictions about your health, our understanding of your disease, our treatment for you if you get sick, and so on. And it turns out that a lot of this really hasn't come to pass. Basically, the issue is that we have a lot of data, but the statistical analysis of this data is really hard. So the point is, we can sequence your genome, and it's actually very cheap compared to the cost of many medical treatments out there. Um, but the problem is, we don't know what to do with it. And to understand why it's hard to know what to do with this data, I think it helps to just um, take a step back to high school or college biology and just remember what we know about DNA. So you learn in, in your long ago biology class that mom and dad have DNA. And basically, putting aside the details, mom and dad's DNA con combines to give baby's DNA. Um, but this process is not without error. And actually, a lot of errors are made in this process. In particular, in every generation, there's a whole bunch of new mutations that baby has that mom and dad don't have, which are shown here as these purple stars. And these mutations, they happen all the time. Uh, this is just part of the process. You definitely have some mutations in your DNA that your parents didn't have. OK, so everybody has these. And for the most part, these are probably pretty harmless. Um, but not always. Some of these 
de novo mutations, de novo because they're new, and mutations because they are changes to your DNA. Some of these de novo mutations probably aren't harmless. Some of them might increase risk of disease. Some of them actually might be completely lethal so that someone with this de novo mutation would never have been born. So the question really is, if we sequence your DNA and we can sequence your mom and your dad's DNA and we find out which, of your de, no which de novo mutations you have, how can we make sense of those? How do we know which of those are likely to be harmful and potentially increasing your risk for disease or explaining a disease that you already have? And which of those are probably not a big deal and we don't really need to worry about them? So it turns out this is a really hard question to answer. And the reason that it's hard is because there's 9 billion possible of these de novo mutations. The reason for this is because your DNA sequence is 3 billion base pairs long, so an A can switch to a T, a G, or a C, and so on at each of these 3 billion positions. So 3 billion times 3 is 9 billion. And figuring out which one of these actually matter versus being harmless is really hard. So the first thing you might think is, okay, let's just collect more data. Let's just go out and let's try to sequence everyone. Imagine money is no object and we could just sequence everyone in the world. Um, but it turns out that's actually going to not solve the problem. We could literally collect DNA sequencing data from everyone in the world, but that won't actually tell us which of these mutations really matter. The reason for that is because there's 7 billion people on Earth, but there's 9 billion possible de novo mutations. So you literally might not see some of them. If you don't see them, you won't know. Did you just not see them by chance? Or did you not see them because actually the, the one that you didn't see is completely lethal? So someone with it would never have been born. Or if there's a de novo mutation that you do see a whole bunch of times, okay, maybe that sort of suggests that it's not that harmful, but on the other hand, maybe it's actually increasing risk of disease in those people, but there are so many possible diseases, you're just not going to have a lot of power to do that type of association. So it's sort of a crazy situation where there literally aren't enough people alive in order to use data to answer this question directly. So we need statistical models to help fill in this gap. And so a few years ago with some collaborators, uh, we took an approach where we collected a really large data set containing 15 million mutations that for various reasons we believe are really terrible. Like these are mutations that you do not want to have in your DNA. And then another 15 million mutations that we have reason to believe aren't actually that bad. And we collected all the data that we could for these 30 million mutations. So things like which chromosome this mutation is on, um, whether it was a DNA letter A that switched to a C, et cetera. Um, what is the composition of that region of DNA? So is it rich in these particular letters versus those particular letters? Is that region of DNA very highly conserved or does it tend to be very different across individuals and across species and so on? So all the data that we possibly could and we actually just fit a pretty simple statistical classifier in order to try to classify mutations into whether or not they're harmless or harmful. And on the basis of this classifier, we could actually compute our predictions for the effects of all 9 billion possible de novo mutations. And again, we're never, there's no way you could collect enough data to actually see all 9 billion of these mutations, but we nonetheless can get predictions for all 9 billion of them. And we published this in a paper. Um, and what this is is a resource that really makes it possible now for, for anyone, anywhere, a researcher, a doctor, whoever, who has de novo mutations that they want to investigate to just go to our website, type in the position and the chromosome number and also the type of mutation. So for example, if an A mutated to a T and so on, and get our prediction for whether or not that mutation is probably harmless or whether or not it's something that's potentially very devastating that should be investigated further. Um, so this is just an example of how even though we have a lot of data, data alone isn't going to solve our problem and we're going to need to fill in the gaps through statistical modeling in order to be able to not only make use of the data we have, but also answer scientific questions that can't be answered by way of data alone. So that's all that I have to say and thanks so much for your attention. Wonderful. Hey, we have time for, for a couple of questions, so please fire away. Let me, oh, oh, you have, you have a quick. So the thing is that you don't just encounter mutations in the time of birth, it also happens over the next time. So how do you take care of temporary Yeah, that's a really great question. So like, the, the question was, we don't just, there aren't just mutations that happen at birth. Mutations can actually accrue over the course of a lifetime. And that's definitely true. Um, so de novo mutations, I'm mentioning those now as a motivation for something that we might want to study that we'll never have enough data on. But you're absolutely right that mutations don't just happen at birth. For example, in certain types of cancer, we expect to see a lot of mutations accruing.
and things like that. Um, but these scores that we've developed for predictions of the effects of all 9 billion possible variants can still be useful in that setting because even if a mutation occurs later, we're still going to want to know, is that a mutation that's probably harmful or is it probably a pretty harmless mutation? Yeah. We're going to take a question from uh, Facebook or Twitter. Yeah, yeah, we've got a question from Facebook here. Uh, so there are a lot of privacy rights issues when you're working with DNA data, whether it's personally identifiable. Can you comment on how you ensure that people's privacy is respected while you work with the data? Yeah, that's a really good question. So within the scope of this project, um, we are not working with individual patients' genomic data. Um, but the idea that an individual person's genomic data has privacy issues associated with it is really serious and it's, it's a very serious ethical issue. So for example, one way that this comes up is I could be like, okay, like here's my genetic data. I'm just gonna like post it to the internet. It's my data and I can just make it public. And on the one hand, it seems like I should have a right to do that. But on the other hand, if I have some uh, very serious hereditary condition in my DNA, then I've just revealed information not only about my parents, but also my siblings and potentially my second cousins. And so I really revealed information about them as well that um, I didn't necessarily have their permission to do. So issues associated with privacy of DNA are very serious. Um, and for this reason, human genetic data is not usually like put on the web for public access. Well, thanks so much, Daniela, for your wonderful talk.